I love introducing my friend and um, uh, just a California homegrown uh, success story extraordinaire. Uh, Linda Weinman is, um, I'll let, let her tell you a little bit more about her background, but I just want to say um, she's one of Santa Barbara's sweethearts. She is our success story. We all uh, feel like she's our sister. We, we love her. We are so proud of her. And if you spend any time around Santa Barbara at all, you would see some of the results of her philanthropy, her commitment to the community, and the success of her company, which has been amazing. As I like to tell Linda, took her 20 years, and she's an overnight success. <laughs> Linda Wyman is co-founder with her husband, Bruce, and she's the executive chair of Linda.com. It's one of the most successful companies in online education today. Through a comprehensive library of instructional videos taught by industry experts, Lynda.com teaches technology, design, and business skills to millions of individuals, corporate, academic, and government subscribers. Well, we've asked Linda to tell you a little bit about her journey and her company and answer your questions and have a good interactive uh, session. You've got 55 minutes. Please welcome Linda Wyman. <laughs> Well, it's uh, wonderful to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And um, I recently spoke at a conference where it was a lot of web de designers, and they had asked me to be on the agenda. And I was sitting in the audience listening to everybody talk about what they had built and you know these really technical processes and um, how they had organized their teams and things like that. And I thought, what am I going to talk about? You know, I don't do what they do. So what I realized was that when you create a company. It's, it is creating a product and that your company is really kind of an imprint of a lot of your own life influences and that's certainly how mine unfolded. And also your company has its own life force and it's a lot of people who help you build it. It's not just you alone. So because my company is called lynda.com, often people think that I do this all by myself. We actually have close to 500 employees. We have over 300 instructors who contribute to our library, and we have um, you know hundreds of, of contractors. So that's hardly something that I'm doing by myself, but I did come up with the idea, and it really wasn't sort of an idea on the gate to be as big as we are today. So I thought I would tell you a little bit about my story, and a little bit about the business model too, because I think part of your interest in today's agenda is to think about new economies and new kinds of business models on LinkedIn.com is definitely representative of that. Um, so when I was uh, little, I, uh, you know, until about third grade, I was a straight A student. I really loved school, but my parents got divorced and we had a, a very contentious situation between them and I was sent to live with my grandparents and I was the oldest of three. And so at a pretty young age, I became the parent of my siblings. And I also encountered a lot of abandonment. And um, when I ended up ultimately living with my dad and my stepmother, my stepmother didn't really want us. And so my grandparents didn't want us. First my mom didn't want us, then my grandparents didn't want us, then my stepmother didn't want us. So I just had a series of a lot of issues of abandonment. And it impacted my schoolwork. I mean, I think that actually happens to a lot of people who get disenfranchised when they're in school because of things that are happening in their home. So I was a very, believe it or not, shy person, introverted, um, didn't have a lot of self-confidence, um, was always ultra-responsible though. I think that kind of early designation of being the oldest child and being the caregiver to my brother and sister was something that made me a leader from the time that I was really young. And so I look at that as part of this road to where I am today. So um, when I was in junior high, I just hated school to such a degree that I don't know how it came to me, but somebody gave me a book called Summer Hill, which was about a progressive style of education. Um, the school was in England, and it sounded very idyllic, and it was this idea that there were no grades, no prerequisites, kids got to learn whatever they wanted, 
Um, there was no structure. And this book claimed that what the end result of that would be is that it would develop students who loved learning and were self-motivated to figure and to find their own passions according to their own aptitude and their own interests. And this just sounded to me like the answer. So I, my parents were, I was living with my stepmother and my um, father and we were, you know, squarely middle class, not really lower, not really upper, just, you know, paycheck to paycheck. Um, my dad worked in the film industry as a, as a sound effects editor. And, um, and my mom, you know, had a secretarial job. And so um, I, we could not afford a private school, but I managed to convince the headmaster of an alternative high school near me to allow me to pay my own way, and I earned $80 a month by working at a hot dog stand. And so I was the only student who went to this progressive, alternative, hippie high school, to be perfectly honest with you. No structure. Um, you know, I, I basically uh, paid my own way, but I also was very lost. And so the first probably year, I did very little. I threw pottery and I, you know, attended a few classes, but I wasn't really ignited by the love of learning. This, you know, this transformation that was supposed to happen to me didn't happen. And there was a women's studies class um, when I was 15, and I thought, oh, you know, feminism, that's a bunch of bra burning, man hating. You know, I had all the sort of stereotypes that I think a lot of people have with that word. But um, I went and attended the class, and it, and it, I think, completely changed my life because it made me understand where I had come from, that my mother and her mother and her mother's mother had never been led to believe that they could be anything other than mothers and caregivers and wives. And um, I think all of those are wonderful things, and I am a mother and I am a wife. But it gave me this idea that, oh, maybe I should think about what I want to be. And so it was this other sort of really key moment in my life, just like um, Summerhill, where it was it, the, the underlying message of, of that kind of school is trust in people to figure out what it is that they want to do and trust in yourself that you can kind of chart your own path, that your path doesn't have to be like everybody else's path, but you have your own. And also this idea that, oh, I can be anything I want to be. And that was actually at the time, as we all know, a lot of us are my age in here, um, that that was a, a very transformative idea that hadn't really come to the surface before that, that time and place. So um, I went to, I also went to the similar kind of college, and in college I studied um, women in business. I took a, a business uh, course for a year. I also ran the student art gallery for a year that I was able to be an intern under, under uh, working under the dean. And when I got out of school, I thought I wanted to, um, my internship was to run the art gallery, and I thought that's what I wanted to do, was to run museums and be in that kind of work. And the only job that I could get was from the owner of an art gallery, but he also had a store, and so he hired me to be the manager of his store. And I learned how to um, be a store buyer and buy things and kind of set up the store and manage the store, and I really liked it. And somehow I convinced my grandfather to loan me $20,000 and let me open my own store when I was 23. So I think, you know, part of the story kind of shows you that I was somewhat of a loner. I, I was very responsible because I had to be responsible at a young age. And I, and I kind of was charting my own path already. And, um, and also open to new things, you know. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was just sort of floating along trying to figure that out. And um, the store went down in flames. I ran it for about four years. It went, you know, out of business. I lost all my grandfather's money. I felt like a horrible failure. I thought, you know, this was the biggest thing I've ever done with my life. Who will ever hire me again? What, you know, I, I really felt bad about myself. And my boyfriend at the time, ran a, he was a special effects animator and he invited me to come and help him do camera work and, um, and learn how to be a camera operator. And so that was my kind of next career and I was just like, okay, I'll do that. And I liked it just fine and I ended up, you know, being fairly good at it and I became a camera operator and I did all these things and that was also probably my first experience of being in a male-dominated industry because in special effects it was almost all guys and I was the only woman in this company besides the secretary, but I wasn't doing secretarial work, I was doing technical work. And so that kind of started to give me the experience that I think um, you know a lot of us have had to overcome, which is how do you establish respect and um, 
you know, authority and position within that kind of a structure. And so um, I ended up, uh, you know, making that my career and along the way I, I got my first computer. I, I didn't touch a computer until I was 28 years old, which is unheard of today, but probably, I mean, I'm just looking around, I'm almost 60, I think some, I, raise your hand if you're almost 60 or over 60, okay. So I'm just looking around thinking like maybe some of you are my age. Um, and so we eventually um, got married, had a baby. Um, when I was working in special effects, it was very unfriendly to young mothers because you're expected to work very long hours, work on it, you know, you're working on a movie, it doesn't matter, you know, if you have to pull three all-nighters, that's just expected. So I realized pretty quickly that it wasn't gonna mix with having a young child, and I, at the time, had, <clears throat> had um, done a project on the personal computer, and I'm actually in Wikipedia for this, um, because I was the first person, and I was invited to do it, it wasn't like I invented this assignment for myself, but I got a job to do animatics for Star Trek V, and, um, I'm sorry, Star Trek IV. And what that meant was that I was making animations out of the storyboards, and I was pre-visualizing the film, but I did it on a computer. It had always been done hand-drawn before then. So that got the attention of Apple Computer and got the attention of a bunch of people, and I was invited to go speak at Art Center College of Design, which for artists and, um, and, and uh, uh, people who do graphic arts, and they have a lot of different disciplines, car designers, it's, it's like the Harvard of art schools. It's kind of amazing, but they're a trade school, and what they believe is that it should be working practitioners who are teaching the trade school, and so they only hire teachers who are established professionals who can actually share practical knowledge with the students. So I was actually qualified to be a teacher there, even though I had no teaching degree and no teaching experience. And so they invited me to come be a teacher, and that was a way better career, being a young mom, because I had fixed hours, and I just found that I just absolutely loved explaining things and so I would also just take great joy in creating handouts and, and taking screenshots of you know well this menu looks like this and then you do this and watching them all create their projects and I just absolutely love teaching and so while I was at Art Center the internet kind of came into all of our consciousness um, I first saw it and it was in 1994 and I just realized that my art students were going to need to know how to put their portfolios online. They were going to need to know how to make websites for other people. That this was, in a way, the new business card, the new brochure. That um, you know, this was something they needed to learn. So I went to a bookstore, trying to find a book on, to teach them with, to assign to them, and realized that there was no book on this topic. And so I decided in the bookstore that I would write the book. And that's just kind of was really from my alternative education background that, you know, if you're interested in something, you just figure it out. You just go do it. And so, I, you know, people say, well, how, why did you think you could do that? And I don't know. You just had that belief that you could. And so um, I couldn't find a, um, a publisher right away. It was actually a real challenge because the Internet was very new. And the only books were about HTML, which is the programming language, and nobody wanted to publish a book that would show how you would actually make the whole website, the design part of it, the art part of it, the color, the typography, all that kind of stuff. And that was what I wanted to write about. So I, I couldn't get a publisher, and I convinced a magazine to let me publish installments of my book as magazine articles. And while somebody had read my, someone read my article, and she was Debbie at Debbie.com, and she wrote me an email. And she said, I've got a page with the Debbies on the web. And I just went to her page and it was, you know, a link of 10 other pages of Debbie's. I mean, if you can imagine such a thing, that there were so few Debbie's on the web that somebody could have a page of all the Debbie's on the web. Um, but I thought, that gave me the idea, oh, I wonder if Linda.com is available. And it was, it cost $35. And I was able to secure it for myself. And I used it as a sandbox to teach myself web design. And at the time, my book publisher didn't have a website. And my book publisher was Macmillan, the largest book publisher in the world. And the college didn't have a website. So I used Linda.com and I let all my students have password to my website and taught them how to upload their portfolios. And, and it was really amazing. But something, um, a number of things happened, because I'm kind of trying to tell you the key points of, of things that really impacted me. And um, writing that book had an impact in that it was my first experience one to many. 
when you're teaching you know, in a classroom, it might be this many students, it's a really large class. But when you write a book, you're, you know, that's to, for me, it was to hundreds of thousands of people. My book was translated into dozens of languages. And just like lightning only striking once, I, my very first book was a bestseller. And I also, um, it was translated into dozens of languages. It became the de facto book on web design for lots of colleges and, and people. And at the time, it was right at the beginning of the dot-com boom. And so it was sort of the it skill at the it time, and I had the it book, and it was, you know, like all the stars aligning. And so um, having written that book, it gave me exposure to a very different kind of business model. So my background in my store, it's a business model of you buy a physical product, you mark it up, you sell it, you have, you know, sometimes you have inventory that doesn't sell, there's a lot of sort of inventory issues, markup issues, profit, not easy to make profit at all. Um, but this was really amazing. I had written this book one time, and I kept getting paid for it. And so that was passive income, and that was also my first real experience to, to um, a publishing model. And so um, with that, with the royalties, my husband and I decided that we would move to Ojai, California. We were living in LA, and I was teaching at Art Center, which is in Pasadena. And we could afford to buy our first house. We had the down payment. And so we moved, we bought this first house. We moved to Ojai. And I miss teaching. It was just such a hole in my heart. Um, but, you know, uh, so he had this idea why don't you start a school? And so we started with a physical school teaching web design. And again, it was the it subject, the it time. I mean, someone from Martha Stewart came to our you know, class, and L.L. Bean, and the Vatican, and you know, we had so many. It was amazing, the board industry. I mean, it was like, you know, the whole cross section that you see on the web came to our school. And we were, you, you couldn't study web design in community college even at this point in time because it was just so new. Um, so when what, ha what started to happen was the school got really successful. Our first year, we started the school with twenty thousand dollars of our life savings, and our first year, one point seven million dollars in revenue. And we had to hire people to help us, and um, and eventually, Bruce, my husband, was like, "Well, bring on other teachers. You can't teach. You can't be the only teacher. You're getting burned out." And that idea, frankly, would have not occurred to me to have brought in other teachers because I thought, well, it's lynda.com. They're expecting Linda, right? And so, you know, this is where it's sort of the combination of our two, um, you know, ideas. And so we started to bring on other teachers, and then I wanted to write about things that my book publisher didn't want me to write about. And so um, what happened was I, I ended up say, well, if they won't let me write it. And the reason why they wouldn't is because they already had an author who wrote about that. So when you're in the computer book industry, somebody already writes about Photoshop, and somebody already writes about um, you know, PowerPoint, or whatever all the other topics are. And so um, I said, well, what if we did a, a video? So we did VHS video, and all my film experience came into play. And I actually was the editor and the teacher. My husband drew the covers, and it was really weird. It was just very low tech. Um, and then um, with 9-11, the dot-com crash, and with the um, downturn in the economy happened right around that same time, people stopped wanting to travel, and um, all the companies that had been coming to our school had no more money, because it was all kind of funny money, so it really impacted us. We thought, well, let's just do anything we can do to keep afloat. So we kept writing books, we did consulting, we started a conference, which was really interesting, and we started to um, make all these videos. And when we had enough, we had about 20 of them, we put the videos online and decided to put them online for $25 a month. And it was before broadband, it was before YouTube, it was really too early. So it didn't take off right away. Um, but what ended up happening was, uh, eventually by word of mouth, it kept growing and growing and growing. And one of the interesting things about a subscription model is if you're a growing subscription model, you have a base of income, and then the next month you still keep that base, but you have new people and they grow on that base, and the next month like this. And so about three years into it, um, we realized it was actually growing really fast, but it wasn't obvious to us in the beginning because it was so little income. You know, I think the first year we maybe made $25,000 in income where we, we were trying to piece all these other things together. So um, we all know the internet blew up, um, the, this topic in particular is a really important topic today 
um, the type of, of skills gap that we have, the, kind, the idea that you know, professions exist today that weren't even invented five years ago, or companies have come along the scene that weren't even here. And so lynda.com has filled this very important role of being extremely quick to market. Um, the videos that we produce are, are very easy to follow. They're broken down into little bits, and you can search for them. It's a very affordable price. We had businesses asking us if we would make a business version of lynda.com, because when we first conceived of it, it was just you go on the website, you sign up, and um, you have a membership. <clears throat> and so we had a school come to us and say, it was actually a school district, like we would assign this to everybody in the school instead of books if you would make a back end and give us some reports and give us a way that we could sell this as a license. And so um, I'm going to fast forward, but uh, today, the I think a lot. I wanted to tell you all these stories because um, this idea that people can be self-motivated learners, that people who come to Lynda.com, it's they're not coming because, I mean, they are coming sometimes because their professor is assigning it to them because we're <coughs> used actually in a lot of colleges. In fact, Harvard has a site wide license of Lynda.com, and it's for every student, faculty, and. Um, staff member. It's not just for the students and it's not just for the teachers, which is really cool. Um, and so that might be a situation where your teacher has assigned you, for example, Anderson School of Business assigns six of our Excel classes before you go into the CPA program, or USC Film School wants um, their students to watch the Final Cut Pro to learn how to do video editing before they take a video class so that in class they can study the story and the edit and the the individual projects and what's ended up happening is it's become a complement to in-person education and we all know that we use the internet all the time to look things you know we call it googling things and looking things up and um, probably our biggest competitor is free it is YouTube it is all the videos that you know millions of people are out there publishing but what we've discovered is that people are willing to <coughs> support an affordable subscription price for curated, high quality, excellent materials that they know are taught by credible experts, kind of got that idea from the Art Center experience. And um, the company has, has just been growing and growing and growing. And so um, for many years, um, I think we, at the time that we hit about $10 million in revenue a year just from the subscription service, um, we started to get a lot of venture capitalists calling and asking, you know, can we invest in your company? And and Bruce and myself, my husband and myself, we were still thinking, well, what, you know, we're making enough money, we're able to keep funding our growth. Um, we wouldn't, why would we want to give away any ownership? And the only real reason was so that we could have some liquidity. Um, there was no reason operationally to do it. And so we just made the decision, well, we don't want to give up control. We want to just keep growing it. We got it to about um, 17 million a year in revenue when we brought on a consultant who, because I just kept getting really barraged by requests to invest in us. And so um, there was a local consultant who had worked for Paul Allen for about seven years as his VP of development, and, and he had then started his own consulting pra practice here. And so um, he met myself and Bruce and he learned about our story and he, he consulted with us for about a month and after a month he said, you know, I've evaluated hundreds of companies when I worked for Paul and I've almost never seen one with as much potential as your company. And what you really need is you need professional management, you need to build out your sales team, you need to, you know, there are a lot of things that you need to do and I would be willing to come on as your CEO um, and I think that you wouldn't need to take money. You just, we could continue to build this. And so we did that for another five years together and ultimately took on financing about a year and a half ago of a $103 million investment um, for a minority stake in our company. So um, my husband and I still have controlling interests and we were able to give everyone in the company stock options and it's allowed us to accelerate some of our growth. Um, when we first started, of course, we were, we were one of the first, so we didn't have a lot of competitors. Today, there are lots and lots of people who know how successful Lynda.com is and are, are looking to create models that are similar or, you know, or slightly different. I mean, there are lots and lots of flavors of online education today. And our particular flavor um, is, uh, is a very free form kind of, it's more of a library. It's not 
emulating school. It's not, I don't know if, how many of you have heard of MOOCs, but there's been, that was sort of the word of the year a year or two ago, but um, like Harvard is offering online classes and MIT and Stanford, and those look very similar to a school where you, you know, there's a time, there's a date and time when it starts, um, you get a week's worth of assignments, you have assignments, you have tests. Lynda.com is just very free form. It's, you know, if you were to come on to learn PowerPoint, for example, you could also learn about typography and color and how to put videos in your PowerPoint and how to make videos. And so it's a lot of ancillary kind of skills. And another thing that we did about uh, six years ago was we started to create documentaries as well. And that came out of the influence of having done conferences. What we realized at our conference was that people were coming to be inspired. They were coming to listen to leaders and see really exciting work. And we thought, you know, we're doing all this instruction work on Lincoln.com, but we're not really inspiring people. So we made this document of inspirations, and we profile different professionals who are doing, who have made successes in the field, in art fields, and how they got there, and what their journey looked like. And so that's been a really wonderful um, thing to do. So um, one of the things that um, you know, there's a there. Obviously, we have we're sort of at a crisis in education. I think a lot of people today are are very upset with how costly education is. The national student uh, loan debt is has now exceeded credit card debt in our com country. Um, they're, they aren't making new physical schools. I mean, there's really been no major new school that's been built um, in a long time, and the demand is, is really ferocious, and uh, a lot of people don't get the grades, they don't have the income. There's just a lot of, a lot more have-nots than there are haves, unfortunately. And there's also the promise that a diploma will mean that you get a job, it will mean that you have an income, it will mean that you have access to that dream of having that good life. And so um, I still very much believe in the importance of face-to-face -face learning and face-to-face -face in, um, interaction like what we're having here. But I think that there is also a huge benefit to partnering that with the things that we can do really well online, like distribute the top experts in the world, the sorts of things that Lynda.com is doing. And so it's really been um, quite the journey to not only build this for individuals, but also to build it for colleges and build it for um, businesses and realize that the problem that we're solving is so big and that there's just so much need for what we do. And while I'm very much um, the kind of person who likes small groups and our company was very homegrown and very family oriented, I hope it still feels like family, although it's getting quite big, I don't know everybody anymore. Um, I, I realized, we realized early on that our idea was better if it was bigger. The more people that we can impact and help, that that's the mission of our company, to help people stay current with technology, is better served by us being big than by us being small. So we kind of had that moment in time, that inflection point when people asked us, can we buy it from you or can we control it? And we decided, no, we've been handed a once in a lifetime opportunity and we're gonna be the ones to do it. And so, um, it's, it's been a dream, it's been, as Patty said, almost 20 years in the making, and um, I, I wanted to you know, not only share my, my personal background, but also maybe some of the influences that caused us to come up with the idea and how we pivoted and kind of changed course along the way, as I'm sure so many businesses do. So um, that's my story, and I'd love to take your, take your questions. Oh, Linda, it's a great story. It really is. And it's, uh, it's an area that I've actually uh, had some focus on and uh, uh, have been trying to follow. So my question is, obviously, companies like Coursera uh, have had an impact, and it's growing. They still haven't figured out how to monetize their business. I was just there um, two days ago. Yeah. I was at their, uh, gave a talk at their campus. Uh, and, and it's growing, obviously, sure. and more universities are on. Um, how does a company like the Khan Academy um, have an impact? Is it complementary? Is it 
it's a somewhat of a different model. Again, it's all free. Started, you know, by the, the uncle who was trying to teach his niece in New Orleans uh, on her math program, and the teachers have embraced it, and now it's just exploded. So, you know, could you elaborate on, on how those types of models are either impacting your company in in positive ways, or you know, causing you to be challenged, mm -hmm. etc. Um, well, I think very highly of both of those mm -hmm. companies. Um, for those of you who haven't heard of them, Coursera is uh, taking a lot of university courses and putting them online for free. And hundreds of thousands of people can take classes that they couldn't otherwise have dreamed of taking. And Khan Academy publishes videos just like we do, mostly in math, although he's expanding into some other areas. And, he, and both of those are free. Uh, and so I think they're terrific. I think um, you would go to a class would be really different than coming to lynda.com where it's more of a library. You know, if you think about it, you take um, a class and, you know, how many classes can you take? You can take maybe five or you start to get to full tilt. Whereas when you're in a library, you know, it's more this idea of abundance, like you might grab 20 books and read a paragraph from that and a chapter. So we're more of a mashup and we're more of a library and also, if you think about the difference between a class and a library, class, everybody's sort of sitting, listening to the teacher, all getting the same experience. Library, every single person in that library is on a different mission to find out about something different and learning different things. So that's really what we're doing on Linda and also what you're doing on, on Khan. And so, you know, we made this decision really early on to charge and it was sort of blasphemous because, um, you know, I think a lot of people think the internet needs to be free. Um, and so we started uh, because we were totally bootstrapped. And we had no choice. We didn't really think about, I think there's a whole generation today that thinks about, oh, we need angels funding and we need to, you know, get VC, we need to get investment to start our business. Well, we started our business without that. So we had to make money. That was, we didn't have any other alternative. It was very old fashioned. And it, it, along the way, you know, realized that people are willing to pay an affordable price. And one of the other things that I failed to mention is that we pay our instructors and we use the same book publishing model. So our instructors earn passive income. And many of them are earning way more than they can earn being university professors or in any other career. And so um, the business model itself is, is pretty incredible. I don't actually know of a better business model. And what it's allowed us to do is to pay our teachers, pay our staff, grow our company, improve our product. Um, if, you, you know, if, you're, if you are relying, like Khan, on philanthropy, um, it's, it's working for him and he's expanding and I absolutely love what he does. So this is not any disrespect to what he's doing. But it, it's just a very different model. So you know, if you have one or two philanthropists fall out or whatever, um, you're beholden to very few, whereas we're beholden to <coughs> a lot of people hold us up. Um, it's actually over four million people. Four million hands are holding us up in the air. Wow. So I'd rather be held up by that than um, a few personally. But I, I, it's not to say I. I really respect what, what he's done, and I think that there's room for everybody. If you think about book publishers, there isn't only one, you know? And if you think about record, pub, you know, like, we don't even call them records anymore. Um, <laughs> recording, you know, whatever, the recording industry. You know, you don't only buy down the path of, you know, oh, I'm only gonna buy Motown records, or I'm only, you know, you think about it, and we all crave different information, and we go to different trusted sources, and sometimes we get free, and sometimes we pay, and. To me, the thing to pay attention to is, do people like what we're doing? Is our membership growing? Are our customers happy? And all of those things are true. And so, um, rather than be overly concerned and obsessing about a lot of other competitors, and there are, and there will be a lot more, because the whole idea is anybody can be a publisher now, so which I, you know, which I actually embrace and think is great. Um, and so I think that to stay competitive, it just means keep creating a great product that people need and keep listening to your customers and and uh, don't lose the ones that you've already got. So I think that's where we where we keep our, our focus. Yes. And there's also a mic here Thank you. in case anybody has any questions you can hear too. Um, yes, uh, your story is wonderful and what you're doing is wonderful. 
Um, my question is, what would the dissolution of net neutrality do to your business and to our ability to use the net? Uh, it's very bad. I'm, I'm, I'm totally against what's, what's happening, and um, it, has, it hasn't affected us yet, but it certainly could. And for those of you who don't know, what just changed was that, um, I, I'm probably not going to explain it very well, but um, companies can basically buy the ability to, to have faster pipes mm -hmm. on the internet yeah. so that you know a large uh, telecom could control if lynda.com has faster or slow speed and so we would have to either pay extra for that or our customers would have to pay extra for that and I think the, um, the problem with that is that it's going to impact performance for a lot of companies that can't afford it um, and people I mean it's just going to change the economics of, of the internet and also sort of the democracy of it so um, I'm, I'm uh, very disappointed that it passed and, and that's my it's just proposed right now it's just proposed. well I, I, oh, I thought that it, that it was more than it that it's the comment period um, uh, Frank Wheeler was the, Frank Wheeler was the head of the um, FCC has published uh, what he wants to do to bring it back to net neutrality. But um, I don't want to talk about Frank Wheeler. I don't find him that interesting. It's a, com <laughs> it's a comment period. If we don't want this, everybody should get their comments in. Um, your story is amazing. Um, do you think of yourself as an entrepreneur? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, I do. You know, what strikes me is that your business is, at its essence, an old school business. You're right. It's teaching. It's teaching. So. And that's a that's a and it's publishing. It's teaching. It's publishing. It's it's paying people. You know, I mean, I, it's it, that's actually very rare. And it's funny because um, you know, Patty was saying that Lynda.com supports a lot of things in Santa Barbara. And one of the things that we support is UCSB Arts and Lectures program. And I end up meeting a lot of the speakers who come through town. And I recently was able to meet Gloria Steinem, who Patty was too. And she was just. I love your model. You've solved it. She's like, you know, when we ran Ms. Magazine and, and uh, we had to take advertising, it really impacted the integrity of our journalism. And she said, but now I look at a lot of things that don't have advertisers, but they um, they don't pay their contributors. So she said, you figured out how to do how to do both, how to not have how to be unbiased, but also pay your contributors. So that was a big honor to have her say that. To me. It, it is, and she's she her observation is correct. So now that you've taken the investment, um, we all know how the money works. Mm -hmm. The money wants scale and the money wants an end game. It yes. wants a liquidity event. So to go back to your, your business, it's, it, at its essence, it's a professional services business. Teachers are professionals. How do you scale that so that you can honor the investment and what do you see your liquidity event to be? Your end game. Yeah, I mean, it's it's they're all great questions, and it was actually an agonizing decision for me and my husband because we knew exactly what you're saying. That when you take money, you know, they're not doing it out of the kindness of their heart. They do want eventually to have a return on that. And we were extremely lucky because we've been pursued for such a long time that we were able to negotiate in the term sheet that there's no actual uh, date for that exit. But of course, there will be an exit someday, and so. We're scaling um, faster than they even expected when they invested in us already. So we're, we're meeting all of their expectations. And we're grooming ourselves so that we have any kind of option. We could be acquired, we could go public, um, and we call the shots. We don't have to do that until we want to. And uh, you know, I think for me and my husband, one, like I said, I'm almost 60 and I've been doing this for 20 years, and, and it's, it's really exhausting to run a, a fast-growing company. And, Someday I would like to um, not work as hard as I work today, and I feel like this is something that we built, and you know we deserve to be the ones to, uh, and the people, the other people who built it deserve to be the ones who benefit from the growth of the company, the, the value in the company, not just the value of, um, you know, not just the cash flow and the business model and paying people and all of that. So it's. Um, you know, it's it's an opportunity that doesn't come to everybody, and we're extremely fortunate that we have that opportunity. And um, what we are have been able to do is pretty much just call the shots because it will be up to us when that when that time comes. But I think for a very long time we've been grooming. I mean, we've been professionally managed, and we've had audited financials. I mean, we've we. 
we could go public tomorrow if we so chose. We've chosen not to. Um, so it'll be a deliberate decision. It'll be on our time frame, and that's that's kind of nice. Did your grandfather live to see your success? No, he did not. How about your parents? Um, my dad passed, but he knew that I was pretty successful before he passed, and he just passed a few years ago. And um, my other parents are still around. They're very proud. I have step parents, so <laughs> I, I say parent. I have you know many many people I call parents. Yes. Yeah. Hi, I'm Alice Hockenberry. I just wanted to uh, ask a little bit about how you and your husband, in a, you know, husband and wife, members, how do you negotiate? I mean, it's, it, it's your name. Yeah. Do you feel like you're the president and CEO? I mean, how do you all negotiate that? So it's a great question. Problems. Oh yeah, it's personally a, and professionally. No, no, it's a to, it's a great prop. It's a great great question, and we've gotten a lot better at it over the years. When we first started, <laughs> um, there when we first started, there was a point where we couldn't. We had offices at the opposite end of the of the hallway because you know we were we were just having you know too many disagreements, and you know I think that we we really did have to figure it out, and I can't tell you the formula of how it works. It's you know, he is an extremely smart, talented person who I respect a lot, and I think just over the years, anybody who's been married kind of knows what what each partner is better at and, and what to give in to. You know, like my husband's an artist, and so design decisions, most often I leave up to him. You know, there are a few times where I'll dig in my heels and I won't agree with something, but I realize that he has seniority on me there. And I have seniority on him on how to teach, you know, or, or how to communicate um, with probably the written word and he probably how to communicate visually. And so it's really been an amazing partnership. But people who know my husband, um, he actually has a pretty interesting story too in that he has Asperger's syndrome and so he's a very kind of socially, you know, awkward person. And so sometimes I think people meet us and they're just like, that's her husband. You know, I mean, I, I hope he wouldn't mind if I said that. Um, but then when they get to know him, they realize that he's a raging genius and they completely see why he's my husband and you know he's, he's an unusual person and I feel really grateful that I've been able to um, you know benefit from being around his genius and I know he feels really grateful just the kind of combination of the two of us and the ideas that we had the sensibilities we had the values we had have been extremely complimentary but it's certainly not without conflict and sometimes um, it makes other people uncomfortable. I mean, you know how you've ever been around like a married couple and they're bickering and it's like, I don't want to be here. And I know there are moments like that at lynda.com and I always cringe when they happen, but I guess they're inevitable, you know, just that's the nature of a marriage, unfortunately. <laughs> yes. Yes, hi. Uh, you describe your business as a kind of library and I'm just wondering in terms of security, hacking, and all of the things that have been happening over the past few years, has that changed the way your business operates and have you really had to increase security to deal with those sorts of things? Um, or maybe you don't want to say. Oh, no, no. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't know how to actually explain to you what we've done because those are other people with other skills. But um, absolutely, there have been a lot of, you know, since when we first started, talk about old school, we had a P.O. box on our website and that was how you sent us money. So we did not even have e-commerce. So I think for any company that's been on the internet as long as we have, there have been many flavors and iterations of how you make the payment process more secure. Um, we're one of the top tier um, company. I mean, if you look at our, there's a thing called an Alexa rating, which is how popular your website yeah. is. And we're in the top 1,000 um, in the world. So we're, we have a huge amount of traffic. We have to have rock solid IT. Um, and, you know, especially when the recent, um, gosh, I'm not thinking of the name of the recent. Target. 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 Um, there was definitely a scramble within the organization within, you know, it was like a 24, 48 hour period of, okay, what are we going to do about it? Are we impacted? And locking everything down and figuring out if that had affected us, which it had not. Um, and so we have a great IT team and it's absolutely got to be part of your vernacular if you're an internet business is understanding your security. So as a company, how do you ensure the professional integrity of those who are developing the product that is in your library? Great question. 
Um, it started as sort of an intu I intuited it <laughs> in that you know when we first started the school I was basically oh people would ask us for a class that I didn't know how to teach so I had been out on the conference circuit and I had met a lot of other instructors and knew all the book writers and so it was just sort of like my circle of friends and people that I knew who were good teachers and now over you know time because we published um, last year 1,200 hours of instructional video in the form of over 700 courses, and that just means they're collections of, of uh, individual videos. We call them courses, but it's it's really just a folder of, of videos that would teach in a linear order if you wanted to watch them in a linear order. Um, and so when, now what we have is we have pro, uh, content managers, and they are experts in their given field. And so they're searching the world for the top book authors, bloggers, conference speakers, experts, and then we do have a um, kind of like a screen test that we put people through because sometimes somebody can be a good writer but not a good presenter. And then we bring them to our facility and we team them with producers and they learn how to do the instructional design for video which is often really different than doing it for a book or for speaking. And um, after a while, you know, if you look on lynda.com and you look at our authors, you'll see some people have taught one class, other people have taught 50 <coughs> classes. So the people who do it repeatedly and regularly, they don't have to come in and be with the producers. They start to get the hang of it and, and um, need a lot less collaboration in that particular way. Let me follow up with that. Uh, you've been talking a lot about uh, how much money these individuals can make, whether they're bloggers or writers or actors or whatever. How does that work? I mean, I know how it'll work in the television and film industry, but how do, you, how do they do that? They stay at home or work with you part-time. I can see how wonderful that would be for a woman raising children. Yes. But how do you actually make that money? How do you pay them? A very honest question. They are paid royalties based on the popularity of their materials. And they're given an advance. It's so similar to the book and publishing industry. You're given an advance against royalties. And so you know you have that money to develop the course and spend your time doing it. And then if it's popular enough, you get extra on top of that. And um, So every time you sell it to a university or some individual buys it, they get something. Yes. Yeah. If their course is being consumed. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, there are areas that are more popular than others, teachers who are more popular than others. It's not, it's not evenly distributed because it's based on popularity. Hi, thanks so much for sharing your story. I think it was great. Um, and I really admire you for doing this with your husband. I think there's a lot to be said for that. Looking back, is there anything that you would have done differently? Oh, sure. Um, I, I'm grateful that a lot of this happened in an iterative way, you know, and I'm very happy with the end result, which is that, you know, I'm extremely happy with our business model, I'm extremely happy with our product. Um, but I think that for us it was a, a big struggle to understand what kind of leadership to bring in. And for anybody who's ever been in a fast growing company, it's, it's a challenge because you might have somebody who's the right leader when you're one size, and they're not the right leader when you're bigger. And so um, there's been, you know, turnover of leadership <coughs> in certain key areas, and I'm sure I wish I could have been clairvoyant and found the right lead. But I've probably, you know, I just think there's certain bumps and bruises that any business goes through. There's no escaping it. So um, even, you know, even my troubled childhood, I mean, I wouldn't wish it on other people, but I'm grateful because I think that it made me strong. Um, it made me a leader. And I, it, it taught me how to forgive. It taught me so many important things. And sometimes I look at people who don't struggle hard, and sometimes they don't have the grit and the fortitude and the um, constitution to really withstand hard things. And so I just sort of look at all my life experiences and the bad and the good, and I, I just have to live in a place of gratitude for all of it. That's, that's how I view it. Um, hi. Uh I come from a publishing background and uh, news rather than books, and I, I'm just curious about the subscription model. I mean, I understand the annuity value of it, uh, you know, as a revenue source, but why, in terms of the structure of your company, do you think it works for you? And so many media properties can't make it on subscription alone. Well, um, we didn't really consider anything else, and I'll tell you why. It was very 
job reason. In the beginning, we didn't know how to um, secure the videos if we were going to let people download them. <laughs> so we decided to stream them, and we decided to do it as a subscription model. What I like about it now, and it took getting critical mass, and it was, and there were many years where it didn't earn for enough money to even notice this, that it was actually growing and working and going to work. Um, and, and I think that's kind of where a lot of media companies are today, is that they haven't given it the time. Um, to be honest, you know, doing it for one or two years, you don't, you don't yet know how it's, how it's going to work out. And um, I think that it is why I like it is because, especially for learning, is because I like that it's not just a single, it's, it's something that you can do better online than you can do in person. That's partly why I like it so much, because somebody might come to us thinking, oh, I really need to learn how to code. You know, that's a huge meme right now, like everybody in the world should know how to code. But then they come on and they realize, oh, I can, you know, learn about something completely different. I can learn how to become a blogger, or I can learn how to do video, or I can learn how to use my camera. And I think that serendipitous discovery and the idea of being, of just embracing that we all need to learn all the time, I just think that's a, a really beautiful thing. So it started off in a really innocent, sort of unintentional, for an, for an unintentional reason, and then ended up, once it got critical mass, being this sort of juggernaut that I think if other publishers saw it, it could be, they would, they would turn on <coughs> that. Um, and I don't know that every single thing is perfect for a subscription model, to be honest. So that's probably, you know, I mean, if, if I don't know how many of you are, are next Netflix subscribers versus downloading a movie, you know. Um, it's kind of fun to know you have a subscription. Oh, what am I going to watch, you know? It's just sort of, I don't know, there's something wonderful about it. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Okay. Last question. All right. Thank you for coming. I'm Anita Sell from Washington, D.C. Uh, I've followed your site for a long time. It's, it's really extraordinary. Uh, you're welcome. I'm just curious, I do some work in the telecom space, and there's a lot of conversation in Washington about changing demographics and the hyper usage of the internet and broadband by uh, people of color and, and certain other uh, groups. And I'm just curious, how are you marketing and developing your business model based on evolving trends related to customers and, and consumers and, and behavioral characteristics? Because it's, I know on the internet, a lot of marketing is based on behavioral characteristics. And um, I'm just curious, how are you changing your, your marketing, your outreach, and your content to really anticipate the change in the marketplace? It's a great question, and we do it in, in such so many different ways. For um, for one thing, we've had more growth, more organic growth than we've had paid growth, which is a very unusual situation. So we've grown faster by people telling each other that they like Linda.com than we have any amount of money we've ever spent on any kind of marketing. Mm -hmm. um, but we have definitely leveraged online marketing, um, and it's a real learning curve. And that's been one of the organizations in the company, the marketing department, where there are such incredible specialists today in, in areas that didn't even exist you know, five, 10 years ago, um, where uh, to really get skilled at it, you you need to you know try all kinds of different things and really understand how to pivot and A B test things and there's so many layers to it I couldn't even begin to describe it to you because I don't you know, also I don't do that either um, but I think that we haven't you know what we've done also is we've been re so we so we do pay for some advertising but we're also very responsive to our user base. So we're used in universities, we're in 30% of all US universities and colleges in the US. So those teachers and administrators and librarians and, and educators and, and students are all asking us on a daily basis, you know, will you publish this? When, you know, will you come out with this content? So part of it is listening to the demand and part of it is being proactive <coughs> about what we see in the future. For example, um, Adobe just moved to a subscription model from, um, from the Adobe Creative Suite to the Adobe Creative Cloud. And we knew that was coming, but our customers couldn't know that was coming. So in that regard, we were preemptive in that we were planning that content, you know, publishing plan long before and, and you know, were able to come out sort of date and time when they came out with that. So some of it is predictive, it's sort of qualitative, quantitative. 
Um, I keep but I don't, I, I think changing. to your particular question, like are we targeting certain demographics of people, we haven't gotten that sophisticated yet. But I think you never, never say never, it might happen. Um, uh, so I, you know, it's just this sort of evolving field that keeps, keeps getting more and more um, of a science. But it's also an art. So hopefully that answers. Thank you. Oh, my God. Oh. truly inspirational um, thoughts this morning and your journey was very special to us. So I would like on behalf of everyone to give you a small token of our esteem. Thank you so much. Thank you.